Now, I would like to introduce Chris Della for the third week running. Roll on the drums. No, it's too late, we've missed the drums. But do come take the platform, Chris. This is his third and final week, so make the most of it, just for the time being. Thank you. Good morning, church. <laughs> You'll be fed up with seeing me up here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed him mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Thank you, Chris. Amen. Well, apologies, Chris. I, uh, I had a drink of water as you were reading that, and it went down the wrong way. So I started coughing. So apologies to those who could hear me coughing. And do you know, each time I, I come to uh, the sermon slot, the closer I get to it, um, uh, the, cl the, the, the closer my, my, my throat closes up through nerves and the coughing starts and you drink the water and you drink too much water then you go to the toilet and then you come back and because it is an awesome thing to stand and to preach the word of God and I take it seriously and I want to do it well and I want to be accurate to the text and, and all of those things and uh, so... Hence, I'm always that little bit nervous. But Chris has done a superb job, three weeks on the trot. He's read it so well each and every time. I'm sure that we know this story off by heart, don't we? And we're going to, as Helen has said, we're going to conclude our sermon series on the parable of the Good Samaritan because there are lessons that we can continue to learn and there are actions that we can do. Now, Helen has said that if you're a man, you're just looking for the biggest shirt that you can get to be nice and cool. And what I notice is that um, this used to be my biggest shirt, but it's now getting smaller and smaller because each time it's washed, it just has a habit of shrinking. And um, so I think I need to go out and, uh, and get another big shirt uh, and see what happens um, over the summer. Now, we've read this story a good number of times, and uh, you're going to be familiar with a lot of things that I'm going to say. And our lawyer, he challenged Jesus. He, he came, as the word says, he, he tested Jesus. And our lawyer had a number of issues that he was facing within himself. And the biggest issue I think our lawyer had isn't actually necessarily in the text, but I think you can glean it from the text, and particularly the, the phrase when the lawyer says, 
He wanted to justify himself. What was the lawyer's problem? His problem was he was making God in his image. Our lawyer was taking the word of God that he knew, which he read and and he shared with Jesus, but he turned it into his own image because of what he wanted to believe. He wanted to believe that his neighbor was only those from his own people group, the Jews. He wanted to take the law and the written word of God and make it in his own image. The only neighbor I need to worry about is my own. I don't need to worry about those rotten Samaritans, those pagans. I don't need to worry about anyone else except my own people group. And what he had done is taken the beautiful law of God and just minimized it and reduced it to what he wanted it to say. And therefore, when he's talking to the lawyer who wrote the law of God, Jesus Christ himself, he was going to have a few surprises. Jesus, as we learned last week, there was that wonderful word when Jesus spoke to him, he pulled the rug from underneath his feet. He pulled that rug out and he showed our lawyer that his neighbor is any and every human being, not just his fellow Jews. Kapow! All of a sudden, the creation of God in his image is now being elevated to what God really meant. And the challenge to him is, is am I going to live God's way Or am I still going to restrict and live the way that I want to, making it or making God's word fit into my world? And those who were on looking, all of those people who were watching, they were enjoying the story. Poor those religious people, they're a bunch of hypocrites. And when Jesus came to the point, who's going to save this beaten up man? They thought it was going to be one of the ordinary Jews. And then Jesus pulled the rug from under the whole crowd, if you like, from under the whole Jewish nation. Because he then introduced the Samaritan as the man who showed mercy and helped the half-dead man. And as we learned last week, to the Jews, the Samaritans, the, 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 the half-brother who intermarried with pagans, they were as bad as pagans. Pew, spit on them. And so Jesus has pulled the rug. I mean, has Jesus ever pulled the rug from under you with what you have believed? Has Jesus ever taken some of your belief system that you've built up maybe over years, and then you get really into the Bible and all of a sudden you realize that what you want to believe or what you did believe does not line up with Scripture and tumbling down comes part of your wall. Do you know, that's part of discipleship. Part of discipleship is growing and learning and then changing. Because as we grow up from babies to maturity, we believe things, I believe things 20 years ago that I no longer believe today. Because the word of God has actually revealed that actually I I kind of got it wrong. And we need to be a flexible people. When that happens, we need to go God's way and not our own way. And this is the challenge to our lawyer. Which way is he going to go after this encounter? And Jesus punches home his point He's a really good boxer with words, Jesus, isn't he? He's an incredible boxer with words. He says it in such a kind, loving, seemingly gentle way, but boy, it packs a punch, and you cannot deny what Jesus is saying. So he punches home his point. He asks the lawyer, which of the three was a neighbor to the wounded man? And in that question, the lawyer is forced to reply, And what did the lawyer say? Do you know, that lawyer couldn't bring himself even to say the word Samaritan. He couldn't say the Samaritan was the good man. He said it in this way. He said, the one who had mercy on him. He is in a dilemma. And when we're in that dilemma, we can't change necessarily instantly. 
And our lawyer man, he got the point of Jesus, but he couldn't change instantly and speak the word Samaritan. So he said, the man who had mercy on him. And that's the point of our story. God is rich in mercy, and we need to be rich in mercy also. The Greek word for mercy, not that you need to know it, is elios. And the, the force of the Greek word elios is an emotion, an emotion that rises up in us when we come into contact with a situation with an affliction that has come on somebody else undeservedly. I need to say that again. The Greek word for mercy means when we see someone has been afflicted unjustly, they did not deserve it, something has happened and it's come upon them, they did not bring it upon themselves, then something rises up in us that wants to do something, that wants to show compassion and to help the person. You know, many, all those years ago, we, we used to see in our TV screens in Somalia, the, the, all of a sudden, the people are starving. They, they haven't done it to themselves. There's a horrible civil war, and the people are, are starving, and it, it arouses in us compassion to do something. In Romania, when the Ceausescus came plummeting down, and Romania is, is, is blown into, into devastation, bankrupt, and there's a whole generation of people who have grown up in orphanages. Something compassion, mercy. They did not deserve it. It rises up. And actually, many Christians did something about it. And this is what mercy is. It's a genuine need that we see that raises compassion and a desire to do something about it. And mercy is a very big principle of God. In Micah 6, 8, the Bible says this, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That is a sermon in its own right, but I want to focus on mercy, to love mercy, to, to, to love the compassion rising up when we see an injustice and go and do something about it. In the New Testament, in Luke, mercy is required of us as Christians. Luke 6.36, he says this, be merciful just as your father is merciful. And so the end of our story is Jesus said to the lawyer, go and do likewise. Go and be merciful. And Jesus commands us through this story to do exactly the same, to show mercy to our fellow man in genuine need. Our motivation for doing good must be to love others. As God has loved us, our motivation is the love of Christ in us when we see these injustices to go and do something to love our neighbors as ourselves. This love is, is to be genuine in meeting the need of others as compassion rises up in us. So what do we learn from this story? Well, Surely a summary of this passage is it points to us as an individual. Jesus is talking to an individual, the lawyer, and all the onlookers are listening and they're hearing in. But Jesus' dialogue is with the lawyer who is making God in his own image, who has misunderstood some of the basic principles of God, and Jesus pulls the rug and in love corrects him. And it's a hard lesson for this lawyer. And so today, Jesus speaks to us through this story as individuals, as if perhaps we're the lawyer, as if perhaps we don't know it all, and, and hey, we don't know it all. And so for some of us, Jesus, in this story, would be seeking to teach us something to change, perhaps, our fundamental belief of how we've seen this story in the past. And so, 
I have to look at myself. We need a, a heart check. What is my heart like? What does the parable mean for me? What does it mean for you? And the question for me is, when push comes to shove, do I put myself first or the needs of others first? Am I selfish or am I a giver? Well, if that's hard for me, I guess that's hard for you. Some people are much more natural givers in their personality, in their characters than others. But everyone can still go further. This is a challenge to all Christians, and it's a challenge for us. When push comes to shove, do I put myself first or do I put other people first? What does this parable mean for you? Well, I think there could be five lessons I've kind of come across and, and thought about and put together five lessons from this parable. Lesson number one, take a chance. Take a chance on me. Or rather, take a chance with the other person. Take a chance with the other person. Get involved. And getting involved with people has a massive cost, doesn't it? There is a personal cost in getting involved. It's often hard. And often when a situation presents itself to us, we have that human barrier of negativity. I'm not capable. I haven't got the time. Oh, no, that's too scary for me. And we have negative inertia that come upon us. And I'm sure it comes upon all of us at times. And uh, we build excuses in us. I'm too busy. It's none of my business. I've done enough helping people for a while. I guess many pastors might say that. Both the priest and the Levite chose not to get involved. They stayed as far away from the situation as possible. Their excuse, making God in their own image, their excuse was, I have to be richly clean. God's told me to be richly clean. And they forgot all the rest of Scripture, as we looked at last week. They chose to forget all the stuff about loving God, loving ones, who's my neighbor, even my enemy's my neighbor. If his ox falls down, I go and help him. They chose not to get involved and to walk on by but the Samaritan, he didn't shy away from getting involved. He walked over and he had Elios. He saw a man in genuine need and Elios rose up in him. Compassion rose up in him for his fellow human being made in the image of God. And he went over and he did something about it. And we know what he did. He bound up his wounds. He poured oil and wine. He got him on the donkey. He took him to an inn. He paid out of his own money. And he said, whatever the bill is, when I come back, I will pay the bill. This traveler who was beaten up, he was helpless. He was going to die. There is nothing he could do to save himself. And maybe our lawyer, because Jesus knows all things, but maybe our lawyer had been somebody who had traveled from Jerusalem to Damascus and actually had seen the exact same situation that Jesus is talking about. And that's why he wanted to just himself, justify himself, leaving him on the side of the road. Maybe Jesus went further than just a parable. Maybe he was speaking to the lawyer, this is, this is, what, this is what you did. Maybe exposed to him something that he wanted to desperately keep hidden. We don't know, but the lessons are there for all of us to see. The point is, the traveler was helpless. He was going to die. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a parable also about God. God looked at the mess of humanity. He saw us lost in our sin. He saw us unclothed, naked in the cesspit of the mess that we were all making of it in our original sin nature. We were lost in our sin. 
We were dead men and women walking. We were unable to help ourselves. We needed a good Samaritan. We needed a savior. And God looked at the world at a point in time. He saw mankind's helplessness for all of mankind, past, present, and future. He saw us lost. It is in the cesspit of sin that reeks and stinks to a holy God. But God had mercy. He had compassion. Elios rose up in him, seeing our naked, desperate situation where we could not get ourselves out of the pit. And God acted. But how did he act? He acted once for all. At an appointed time, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take the cesspit upon himself and to die on a cross. And for those who would receive and ask and want the help, who would repent from their sin, who would turn to Jesus, he would lift us up. He would bind up our wounds with oil, the oil of the Holy Spirit, and with wine, the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us from sin. Hallelujah. Oil and blood, oil and wine that brings healing to us and salvation that rises up to eternal life. God had that Elios compassion at a point in time, and it's Jesus Christ. God is not going to do anything else. It's Jesus Christ. God has got no other plan. It's just Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be picked up and healed and made whole but Jesus Christ. Now for us, back into our story, one of the greatest temptations that I face, maybe you have faced it as well, when we see someone in need, is the quick solution. I hold my hands up. We see someone in need. It could be a beggar, for example. We can feel guilty. We can feel condemned. I should do something. And we can give money for a quick fix to appease our conscience. I've done that. Was I thinking more about the person or being selfish? Now, I need to tell you that all the Christian professionals will tell you this. Do not give money. All the Christian professionals will tell you, do not give money. The people you're giving the money to, you don't know them. You don't know what they're involved in. You don't know how they'll use it. They could use it on drink. And they could use it on drugs. Don't give money, it might buy their last fix that kills them. Or don't give money, it may go to the criminal gangs. Discerning who is in real need genuine need that deserves mercy rising up as Elios to do something about it, to discern the real need against a scammer can sometimes be rather difficult. It's not easy. But it's still not an excuse for not doing anything. So, we can, and it's a good strategy, offer food. We can go and buy it for them. We can go and take them somewhere. We could buy them water or give them a coffee. We can offer to sit and to talk. We can try to build some form of relationship. A few simple steps can divide the genuine from the scammer. The one in real need from the one who's seeking just to take advantage of a good-natured Christian person. If they are not interested in food or drink, if they give a dismissive answer or they start, and this has happened to me, you start to engage, you offer drink or, or, or food, and they get aggressive. They demand money. Perhaps it's not a genuine need. Perhaps there's an ulterior motive. What are we supposed to do? Perhaps it's a scam. But we've done something. We've made an offer. Do you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, in some of his parables, he said, do not throw pearls before swine. Helena was there. 
Do you know, sometimes it's inappropriate to give the gospel to a person who is not wanting or is not ready to hear the gospel. You know, throwing pearls before swine, giving the gospel might not necessarily be the beginning of the answer. There's a whole load of steps to go in building a relationship to get to a place where a person can trust you, where you can share the gospel. Do you know, sometimes, as Jesus said, you can give a good thing, but, but the world will come and trample you. The world will come and, 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 and sit on you, will revile you, and actually, then you're in danger of having a bit of root go down. So we need to have the wisdom of God in dealing with these situations. Back to our story, it's incredibly clear that the injured man in our story is genuine. This is not a scam. He is really in trouble. The clothes are stripped off him. He is bleeding. He is unconscious. He's probably got very shallow breathing. Here is a genuine real need. I do not believe that Jesus tells us to be scammed or taken advantage of. We need to draw a distinction, but it's no excuse for not doing something or attempting to do something. But we cannot force the gospel. We cannot force ourselves. We need to respect where a person is coming from. And quite frankly, if they want you to disappear, okay, you go. And what did Jesus say? If you go to a house and the peace doesn't rest, then you just dust off your feet. Are you aware of these are you aware of these parables? There is wisdom in being a Christian. We're not to be doormats. We have such an incredible gospel. We mustn't reduce it. We mustn't force it. We mustn't slam it. But to those whose hearts are open, those are the people we find. They're the people who respond. We have a precious thing, and we handle it preciously. Do you know, in my history, there was a, a, an amazing Salvation Army worker in Leamington Spa. Hallelujah for the Salvation Army. Amazing. Haven't they done amazing works? And they do amazing work. And they do. But this man, who was incredible, he ran the Salvation Army drop-in center. They provided breakfast. They had showers. They had washing machines. They had facilities and the like. But after 18 years of serving the same homeless people, the same people trapped in their chosen lifestyle on the streets of Leamington Spa, begging, doing drink and drugs, his conclusion, which will shock you and will shock me, his conclusion was to give tough love, to give challenging love to the people. Do you really want help? Are you in real, desperate, genuine need? And he advocated shutting down the center, no breakfast, no showers or other facilities, but to have a computer on a bare desk in an office. So a person comes. If you have an issue with drink, here is a Christian charity who can help you become sober. The same with drugs. Here's a Christian charity that can help you get clean. I can get you in there. If you're really serious and this is what you really want, there are people who can really help you, but it's going to cost you. You're going to have to mean it. You're going to have to be desperate enough to go and to do it. Or perhaps you need a job. Here's a Christian charity, Christians Against Poverty, for example. A Christian charity that can help you learn the skills to go out and to get a job. Perhaps you're in debt or, or you have trouble gambling. Well, here's a Christian charity. That can help, you know, there are so many Christian charities. Because Christians have a heart, Elios, for people in real need, and they start charities. Even if you have a coffee addiction, I know a place I can send you to get off of caffeine. Or smoking. All of these things. For us as Christians, I think we need to resist the quick fix. Getting involved with people is hard. When we have compassion, when we get involved in people's lives and their genuine need, then I believe we are truly showing the love of Jesus to them. This means we should foster our non-Christian friends because we love them. Not because, I hold my hands up on this as well, not because they're a target for Christianity, not because it's a notch, that's another one that's got saved through me, you know, we all go through these things, surely. Am I the only one? 
uh, hallelujah, at least there's one honest person here. I won't say who it is, but thank you for your honesty. We love people first. Made in the image of God. We see the need. Elios rises up in us. Of course we want to share the gospel. Not because they're a target, but because they are a genuine friend. We like them, not because they're a notch on our bedpost. Actually, that's not a good thing, is it? Um, on, a, um, on our walking stick. Not because they're a notch on our walking stick. So, you know, you've got to be careful. If things come out which you don't mean, you just strike that. We know the greatest need of an unbeliever is their salvation. Doesn't matter what they're into. Unbelievers, doesn't matter what they're into. It doesn't matter what their lifestyle is. It doesn't matter. They don't know any different, but they need salvation. And once they're saved, then the genuine need comes. Then the challenge comes to all of us who were once pagans. The challenge comes. What is my lifestyle going to be? Is it going to match up to the Bible or not? We are all challenged. And this lawyer was definitely challenged. Lesson two. The others are slightly quicker. You'll be pleased to know. Do not count the risk or the reward. When doing good, we should not count the risk or the reward. The priest and the Levite, they counted the risk, and they determined it was too risky to help out. They'd be made unclean. All the clothes they bought from M&S would go in the bin, scrubbing themselves for weeks, all those things. They just walked on by. The Samaritan didn't. It does take getting outside our comfort zone to show mercy and compassion to others. And sometimes there is a risk involved. God calls us to love others despite risk. The Samaritan man, well, I mean, he, he stopped. He was crouching down. He was there. Maybe the robbers were still there and they would get him as well. But he chose to see the need and actually take the risk over his own circumstances in life and help the man. We should also not count the reward for doing good. We do it from a position of love, not that we're going to get a reward. Loving others is one of the things that we must do. This is a dichotomy, isn't it, to earn eternal life. But you see, if you consider the reward for showing mercy, then you're trying to earn eternal life. Very fine line. We cannot be saved by works. So it's very difficult not to have ulterior motives when we're helping other people. The love of Jesus in us should draw us to show mercy to our neighbor. But even that is a challenge. There's lots of hurdles we need to overcome. But I know people who have worked hard in these areas and the more you do it, step by step, the easier it becomes. The more you do it, the more risks you take, the more natural it becomes. Amen? Amen. Lesson three, be willing to sacrifice. Mercy devires sacrifice. God's mercy to us, to a lost world, was the sacrifice of his own son. It's the highest cost. To show mercy has a cost. To God, it was the highest cost, his own son, Jesus Christ. Both loving God with all our heart and loving our neighbor as ourselves comes with a sacrifice. As Christians, in our lifestyles, there's a sacrifice. I was a drunkard, I'm no longer a drunkard. I was on drugs, I'm no longer on drugs. I was a liar and a deceiver, I, but now I'm a Christian. I've put to death lying and deceiving. This is called discipleship. There is sacrifice when we become a Christian. And there's another sacrifice to show Jesus to the people around us. The good Samaritan was willing for the sacrifice. He spent a lot of money on this man. He paid in the inn. He made sure everything was paid for until he came back. He dug deep in his pockets. Loving others has a cost. It could be time. It could be money. It could be overcoming our negative inertia. There's a cost. 
but we have to be willing to sacrifice ourselves, certainly something of ourselves, because it seems to me the Bible says that when we're a Christian, we are a living sacrifice. We are a living sacrifice. I have to say, this is not, a, this is not an easy message, is it? You've got to be a living sacrifice. You've got to give up everything that you really enjoyed. The way, the way to salvation is, only, is narrow. It's only through Jesus. You've got to live a holy, righteous life. And you've got to help a Samaritan. You've got to help the person you don't like. In genuine need. In genuine need. So where are we? Hallelujah. Ocho. The last page. Hallelujah. I had a policy when I was a prison chaplain. When I was a prison chaplain, I could have looked up everyone's record. I could have started with their record. I could have found out who the murderers were, who the sex offenders were. I could have found out who the thieves were. I could have found out who the lawyers were who got caught up in embezzlement. I could have found out all things about the prisoner. But I had a policy that I did not want to know because I didn't want to start off by judging them. My job as a prison chaplain was to show the love of Jesus, to challenge them to repent from their sin, to believe the gospel, and I needed to show them mercy, the mercy of God in Christ. And it was costly. It was draining. It took an awful lot out of me. Ten years, eight months, and two days. And I have to say, sometimes I feel that I've done enough. I could be in the category of, whew, I've helped enough people. I can't take on one more. What a challenge that is. I need to take on one more. I need to take on a hundred more. But for those ten years, eight months, and two days, it was very costly to me. The regime wanted to, as we say, trail them, nail them, and jail them, and throw away the key. I wanted them to know the love of Jesus Christ who died on a cross and showed the mercy, the mercy of God in Christ. I wanted them to know Jesus. So my support of prisoners' genuine need, my support of prisoners' genuine need often brought me in direct conflict with the regime. And it often felt like I was the one being trailed. I was the one who was being nailed, and I was the one who was being jailed. There's a cost to helping people, particularly difficult people, particularly those who've done terrible things. Do we believe that the vilest offender who truly believes can actually be saved? Well, I, I, I do, and I did. But finding the genuine one, whew, that's another matter. I've been scammed so many times. But finding the genuine one, and just one genuine one, it's worth everything. Amen. So the conclusion... Oh, oh I, well, I, something's gone wrong. Do not be too busy. I've, I've missed something. Oh, no. Do not be busy. Number four. I'll go back quickly. I'm on page seven, not page eight. Well, online, you might have a bit of trouble following this, but don't worry about it. It will still make sense. Lesson four, do not be too busy. Make time. We live in such a busy society. I'll read it quickly. We're all busy doing something. I hear from those who are retired. I don't know how I ever had enough time to work. Are you familiar with that one? I'm busier than ever. It's so easy to be busy and to neglect showing mercy and compassion to others. Would we have stopped to help this man? Ah, many of us would have done. Or would we have been too busy? Many of us would have been too busy, I'm sure. Would we have justified ourselves? It's none of my business. Don't let the busyness of life get in the way from helping someone. Amen. Avoid prejudice and avoid legalism. <laughs> this was what I was trying to say about being in the prison. I did not want to prejudice the guys by knowing what they'd done. And I wanted to show compassion of Jesus for them. The Good Samaritan did not show prejudice. It's highly likely that the, the robber beaten up was a Jew. Highly likely he was a Jew. Highly likely he could see he was a Jew one way or another. 
Jenny got it. He put aside any shallowness, any legalism or hatred that he might have had. When resources are tight, we have to help our brothers and sisters. Fellow Christians are a priority to us in Christ. However, however, we must help all others in genuine need as well. It's so easy to be affected by prejudices, a person's nationality, what they believe being opposed to what we believe, a different religion, or their lifestyle. We are not asked as Christians to condone non-biblical lifestyles. But for people who are not Christians, we are to help in genuine need. It's a slightly different matter. If it's in the body, then we have to do something about it. We have to show tough love. But it is so easy to be affected by prejudice or legalism. The Samaritan just looked at the need and he responded. You can sort out the rest of it later. He helped the immediate need. We come to the end. Hallelujah. Get ready, team, to come up and worship. The conclusion to the parable is this. Go and do likewise. At the very end of the parable, Jesus asked the lawyer, which of the three men acted as a neighbor to the injured man? Of course, the lawyer had to answer, but he could not say the word Samaritan, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus tells the lawyer, and he tells us, go and do likewise. Our faith is not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just a whoopee do experience. Christian faith is a change of heart and a change of mind that has an impact on our behaviors as disciples of Christ and has an impact on how we treat those in the world with genuine need. Christian faith produces both salvation for good works in Christ, welling up to eternal life. So three things. Go and extend compassion to everyone, even those people who are different or don't believe the way we do. Go take a chance and get involved in the lives of other people. Show mercy no matter the risk or the reward. Go and be a willing sacrifice and be prepared to take time out of our busy schedule to help. The Lord Jesus says to us today, go and be a good Samaritan to the world. Amen. Amen. <laughs>